acidic. And when hemoglobin starts to become acidic, oxygen is kicked off and it diffuses out of the red blood cell and it goes to the body cells that need it. So that's one, one of the reasons why oxygen is being dissociated from hemoglobin is because of acid. But where's the acid come from? Let's scrutinize over this chemical reaction a little bit more. Remember, this chemical reaction is reversible. So what makes it go to the right sometimes? And what makes it go to the left sometimes? Well, it depends on the concentration of the substances. How much CO2 do we have? Do we have a lot of it? Do we have more CO2 than we do by carb? I mean, uh, by carbonate. If we have more CO2 than we do by carbonate, then this reaction is going to run to the right. So higher concentrations of CO2 makes this reaction run to the right. And look what, look what we keep liberating. The more CO2 we have, the more acid we make. The more CO2 we have, the more acid we make. The more CO2 we have, the more acid we make. And that's why if you have a lot of CO2 in the blood, you become acidic, as I mentioned earlier, right? So that's why at internal respiration, this reaction is running to the right because our cells are liberating a whole bunch of CO2 and this actually increases if the cells are metabolically active. Like, let's say this was a skeletal muscle cell and you're running on a treadmill. They're going to be dumping out a whole bunch of CO2, which means this reaction is going to run to the right, run to the right, run to the right. It's going to make you acidic because your hydrogen ion concentration is going to go up. And so you just induce an acidosis state. Luckily, those chemoreceptors we just mentioned earlier say, hey, our hydrogen ion concentration is too high. We better tell the respiratory centers in the brain to cause our respiratory rate to go up. So while you're running on the treadmill and your muscles are dumping out this CO2 and this reaction is running to the right and you're making a whole lot of acid, the chemoreceptors are telling your brain to make you breathe faster. And when you breathe faster, this reaction at external respiration runs to the left. So when you start to breathe faster, the hydrogen combines with bicarbonate, reforms carb uh, carbonic acid, which is split up into CO2 and water by carbonic anhydrase, the same enzyme that makes it, breaks it apart, and you get rid of CO2. So the faster you respire, the faster this reaction is running to the left at external respiration. So as you're getting rid of CO2 by exhaling out, you're getting rid of acid. All right, so let's go back down here and finish this little conversation and we'll get back to that. So as the CO2 is coming into the red blood cells, 70% of it's combining with water, forming carbonic acid, splits up into bicarbonate and hydrogen. But what is the fate of this bicarbonate, HCO3 minus? Well, that bicarbonate can leave the red blood cell and get out into plasma. Now, another thing I don't like about this picture is they show bicarbonate going straight across the plasma membrane. Well, no ion can cross the plasma membrane on its own. So technically there is a, tr a protein transporter in the membrane, it's called an exchanger. And that transporter actually exchanges one bicarbonate for one chloride. So every time a bicarbonate goes through the exchanger, a chloride would go in the opposite direction, straight through the same exchanger. So this, when we exchange a chloride ion for a bicarbonate at internal respiration, that's called the chloride shift. 
And chloride, the chloride shift is always to the inside of the red blood cell. So at internal respiration, when the red blood cells are unloading oxygen and picking up CO2, they're also gaining chloride so the bicarbonate can come out. So the bicarbonate, as it comes out, then flows in the plasma until the blood gets to the lung level. When the blood gets up to your pulmonary capillaries, look what happens. Yep, you breathe in and oxygen is loaded in the blood. That's a given, right? But we also have a reversal of the chloride shift because this happens. Since we have already made so much bicarbonate by the time the blood has left all the tissues and reached the lung level, there's more bicarbonate than there is CO2 because the majority of all the CO2 was already converted to bicarbonate. So bicarbonate is gonna go in the opposite direction at external respiration. It's gonna go through the, the bicarbonate chloride exchanger into the red blood cell. Chloride then will leave. That's called the reversal of the chloride shift. So bicarbonate comes in, the chloride leaves. And the reason why that's important, by the way, I didn't state it clearly, you, you can't just have ions moving across a membrane. You mess up the membrane potential. So we actually have to keep the membrane neutral. So we exchange one negative for another negative. That's one of the reasons why we do that. So as the bicarbonate comes in, the bicarbonate is going to recombine with hydrogen, which is being kicked off of hemoglobin. Remember, hemoglobin was one of the buffers holding on the hydrogen for us. So as bicarbonate comes in, combines with hydrogen, it forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is split up into water and CO2, bicarbonic anhydrase, and the carbon dioxide leaves hemoglobin. And all of that, which accounts for 93% of the CO2, leaves the red blood cell and enters the lung and you exhale it out. Now look what happens with the pH if you start respiring faster. The faster you breathe, the faster this reaction at external respiration is gonna to run to the left. So the more CO2 that we get rid of by exhaling out, you're getting rid of acid. So yes, when you're working out, your blood pH starts to drop because metabolically active tissues produce acids and they produce a lot of CO2, which is related to acid because of this equation. I mean, let's face it, carbon dioxide is converted into an acid, which liberates hydrogen into solution. So if you're becoming acidic and you need to bring your pH back up to normal, your, lung, your lungs, well, your respiratory system is activated, so you start respiring faster. The faster you breathe, the more CO2 you're getting rid of faster, which means this reaction is running to the left, running to the left, and you're always getting rid of that acid in the form of hydrogen, combining with bicarbonate, and it's basically being reconverted to CO2, and you're exhaling that CO2 out and it helps regulate your pH that way. So that's one way that your lungs in, are involved in pH regulation. So let me give you a little uh, example here of what happens uh, when you hold your breath. I'm sure at one point when you were a kid or whatever, you probably wanted to see how long you could hold your breath underwater or just hold your breath in general. And so you start holding your breath. Sooner or later, you get this little sensation, this little burning sensation in your gut, like you want to breathe. So all of it, when you can't take it anymore, you just open your mouth, you start breathing again. Hopefully you're not in the water, because that would be bad. But you start breathing again. A lot of people think the reason why you have that sensation to breathe again is because you're running out of oxygen. And that's not true at all. Even blood that we call deoxygenated at rest is still saturated with 75% oxygen. No, the reason why you get that burning sensation to breathe 
is because when you're holding your breath, look what you're not doing. When you hold your breath, this reaction is not running to the left and you're not getting rid of CO2. So if this reaction at the top is not running to the left because you're not breathing, down here, all through the body, this reaction is still running to the right because all the cells in the body don't say, hey, they're not breathing. Let's stop making ATP and stop making CO2. They don't do that. Even though you're holding your breath, all the cells are still dumping in CO2 in the blood. So this reaction runs to the right, runs to the right, runs to the right, and look what you're making. You're making acid. So when you hold your breath, what you're basically inducing is an acidosis state. You're making your blood pH drop. You're becoming acidic. In which case we call that respiratory acidosis. So what happens when your pH starts to drop and your hydrogen ion concentration is going up? Well, lo and behold, those chemoreceptors say, hey, we have too much hydrogen. We have too much CO2 and the pH is too low. We need to signal the respiratory muscle to contract, to breathe. And that's the burning sensation that you feel when you're holding your breath because you're consciously inhibiting those muscles from contracting. But there's an involuntary response from our medullary centers, respiratory centers, trying to get those muscles to contract. Now, some people can hold their breath until they pass out. I'm sure you heard of that. But as soon as they pass out, they're going to start breathing again. Of course, unless they fall over and hit their head and damage the brainstem. That's different. I'm not talking about neuronal trauma, neurological trauma. But some people that can hold their breath so long that they pass out, they start breathing again after automatically because of the pontine group automatically fires to the DRG to tell the DRG to make your respiratory muscles contract. So it's kind of cool. It's all regulated on pH and CO2. So when your pH hydrogen ion concentration starts to climb because this reaction keeps running to the right, your pH drops. The chemoreceptors fire to the brain and it tells you to respire faster. So you start breathing faster and this reaction starts running to the right very quick, I mean to the left very quickly. So as it runs to the left, you're getting rid of acid because you're reforming CO2 and CO2 is being released from the body when you exhale. So by exhaling out CO2, you get rid of acid. Kind of cool, huh? All right. So does anybody have any questions about this little picture before I stop sharing it? I have to go to back to our book for a minute. All right. Let me pull up our lab manual again. All right. So the last thing that we need to cover as far as physiology in here is concerned are lung volumes. So when you're, when you're studying, um, the next section you'll see is all the anatomical structures you need to be learning on the models, which by the way, after we're done today, that's, that's what you do for the rest of the lab. You go work on those pre-lab assignments for all the models. If you haven't done that, if you have done it, do the post-lab assignments. If you've done that, just review all your material so you can take your exams early. All right. Um, so the last bit of physiology that's going to be on the physiology test deals with this little graph that we're looking at here. What this graph is and really what it's recording. So in order to measure lung volumes, uh, patients have to breathe in and out of a machine called a spirometer. Normally, we would have a little experiment that we would perform here and measure somebody's lung volumes. It's fairly non-exciting in the lab to do the experiment, but I mean, you do get some readings and you can measure the volumes. But since we're not in lab and we don't have the machine, I'm gonna explain to you what the machine is going to record, right? So the spirometer records changes in lung volumes when a person changes their breathing pattern. And the graph that is recorded, these little wave-like increases and decreases that you see, this is called the spirogram. 
right? So if I hook someone up to this barometer and told them to breathe in normally without trying to breathe, just your normal breathing, don't even think about it, you would get this little wave pattern. You would inhale and you would change lung volume by this much. You would exhale, you would inhale, you would exhale, so forth and so on. And you get this little bit of volume of air entering and leaving the lung during normal, quiet breathing. That's called the tidal volume. Now, everybody's lung volumes are a little bit different given the fact of your body size. And I'm not talking about weight. I'm talking about your height. Are you a very big person? You know, very tall and big like Shaquille O'Neal or something, or, you know, I'm fairly short. I'm only five, nine, but nonetheless, you know, shorter people have smaller lung volumes than taller people. Females typically have lower, smaller lung volumes than the comparably sized male. And you can't say that if you have a really tall female and a very short male, that's different. I'm talking about average height. So body weight does not change your lung volume, but your height does, all right? Because your lungs are bigger. An easy way to explain that would be everybody knows that a little baby has small lungs. So their lung volume is much smaller than ours, right? So the body size means something. But nonetheless, the average tidal volume is somewhere around 500 milliliters volume of air, right? That's what we call tidal volume. Now, before we move forward, because I just remembered to ask you this, you're going to be expected to know that how to, you know, uh, transfer or uh, go from milliliters to liters. You guys know how to change your units? If not, I'm going to tell you how to do that right now. So there's a thousand milliliters in one liter. One thousand milliliters in one liter. So if there's 1,000 milliliters in one liter, and I have 3,100 milliliters, how many liters would that be? 3.1. Somebody unmute and tell me. What's that? 3.1. 3.1, very good. Now, if you can't see it right off the bat, how to convert from milliliters to liters, I'm going to tell you how to do it. So when you're going from the small unit, which is milliliters, you have to move your decimal place three places to the left because you have a thousand milliliters in one liter, which is 10 to the third milliliters, right? So we have to move that decimal place to the left three places to convert to liters. So I would go one, two, three. 3.1 liters. Now, if this was in liters, if I said, oh, we have 3.1 liters, how many milliliters would that be? Well, all you have to do when you're going from the large unit, which is liter, to the smaller unit, which is milliliter, you move your decimal place three places to the right. One, two, Three, 3,100 milliliters are in 3.1 liters. 3.1 liters is 3,100 milliliters. All right, so everybody should know how to convert milliliters to liters and back and forth. I mean, the only problem is the last time you saw this probably was in general biology, unless you did like a chemistry class or something, I don't know. But nonetheless, um, I need y'all to know that. So. In a spirometer experiment, or even if you're if you go you know to the doctor and they're measuring lung, there are three basic lung volumes that can be measured on a basic spirometer. Um, more advanced ones can just calculate everything out for them, but we're going to have to know how to calculate at least four capacities. So we have three lung volumes that you're learning. What are called lung volumes. And we have four lung capacities. So here's how you do it. If you tell somebody to breathe in normally and breathe out 
normally. How much air is ventilating lung? Well, on average, 500 milliliters, give or take your body size. So that's what we call our tidal volume. Now, look what happens if I tell somebody to breathe in as hard as they can after a normal exhalation. Then normally, you breathe out normally. You don't try and you don't try to expire. You just breathe out normally, and then all of a sudden you breathe in as hard as you can. This volume of air from this line right here to this line is called your inspiratory reserve volume. So the basically. The inspiratory reserve volume is the maximal amount of air that you can inhale after a normal inhalation. So I inhale normally, but then instead of stop, I inhale a, as, as much as I can, maximally, I breathe in. That's called your inspiratory reserve volume. Now, if I tell somebody, then to breathe out, and I know they have it all in one, one thing, but normally what you would do is you would have somebody breathe in normally a few times and then say, okay, breathe in as hard as you can, and you would measure their IRV. And then you would have them breathe in and out normally a few times again. And then on their next normal exhalation, tell them to breathe out as hard as they can. You then would record this volume. So this volume from this line to this line is called the expiratory reserve volume, the ERV. So we're going to measure the TV, tidal volume, but your normal quiet breathing. You're going to measure on a spirometer your IRV, which is the inspiratory reserve volume, and you're going to measure the ERV, which is the expiratory reserve volume. You then take these values, which on the test, I'm gonna make these numbers up, by the way. I'm gonna give you some easy numbers. You then take these numbers and you can calculate these capacities over here. So before I show you the formulas, because everybody kind of hates formulas, you can actually learn everything you need to know on this graph. Because look at this. Look what the IRV really is. The inspiratory reserve volume. The IRV is only this volume from here to here. The tidal volume is only from here to here. And the ERV, expiratory reserve volume, is from here to here. Now, you have something called the inspiratory capacity, or the IC. A person's inspiratory capacity is the total volume of air that they can maximally inhale, which includes two things. How much you can normally inhale, which is your tidal volume right there, plus your reserve volume that you can inhale, which is called your inspiratory reserve volume, the IRV, which is all of that. So if you wanted to know the maximal amount of air that you can inhale, which is called the inspiratory capacity, all you have to do is add the TV plus the IRV. And that's exactly what this arrow shows for the inspiratory capacity, right there. So basically the inspiratory capacity is all of the IRV and all of the TV. Now, what about your vital capacity? Your vital capacity is the maximal amount of air volume that you can ventilate in and out of your lungs. So the maximum amount of air that you can ventilate in and out of your lungs is called the vital capacity. So what makes up the vital capacity? Well, the maximal amount of air that you can inhale, which is 
the inspiratory capacity, which is the IRV plus the TV, right? So the vital capacity is the maximum amount of air I can inhale, which is the, the IRV plus the TV, plus the maximal amount of air that I can exhale, which is the ERV. So to calculate the vital capacity, all you have to do is add together the IRV, the TV, and the ERV. Unless you already calculated your IC, all you have to do is add the IC to the ERV. That's the same thing as adding all three, right? Now, to calculate your total lung capacity and something called your functional residual capacity, you have to know a value that is determined from the time of birth, something called your residual volume. So the residual volume is a dedicated volume of air that remains in the respiratory system at all times. No matter how hard you try to breathe out, you cannot get all of the air volume out of the respiratory system. Because in order to achieve that, you would have to have the entire respiratory structures all collapse down on themselves and not have any air in it. All the alveoli would have to collapse down. There's no air in there. Your bronchial tree, your trachea, all that would have to be collapsed down. There's no air in it. So all of those tubes and the alveoli basically remain open, partially due to the residual volume that happened when you took your first breath when you were born. Now in the adult, the residual volume, the average for a male is 1.2 liters, which is 1200 milliliters. And the average for females, of course, is give or take body size again. You can't be comparing a 6'5 female to a 4'5 male, right? So this is average. So the average male is 1.2 liters. The average female is 1.1 liter. And 1.1 liters is 1100 milliliters. So this is the residual volume. So we actually have to know that residual volume down here at the bottom, this is the volume that always stays in the respiratory system. It's called the residual volume. So in order to know your total lung capacity, you basically have to know your vital capacity which is the IRV, the TV, and the ERV. So your vital capacity plus the residual volume is your total lung volume. So to calculate it from all these volumes, your total lung volume would be the IRV plus the TV plus the ERV plus the residual volume. So see, you can learn what you have to add together to get these capacities just from this chart instead of memorizing these equations, right? Or you could just go and learn the equations, it's fine. But, you know, I, I think it's easy just looking at it this way. If, if not, you could do it either way. But the last one that you need to know how to calculate is something called functional residual capacity. The functional residual capacity is called that because it's the capacity of the volume of air that can be inside the lung at one time, which, <coughs> or I should say in the system at once, which includes the maximal amount of air that we can ultimately exhale out. Added to that, the amount of air that stays behind, which is the residual volume. So that's called your functional residual capacity. So that would be the ERV plus the RV. So look at these formulas for a second. The inspiratory capacity, how much air can I inhale? Totally. Well, my tidal volume plus my inspiratory reserve volume. 
The expiratory capacity. How much air can I exhale out? Well, your tidal volume plus the ERV. That's how much I can totally exhale out. The functional residual capacity is the ERV plus the RV. The vital capacity is a total amount of volume of air that we ventilate the lungs with. So how much can I inhale in? The inspiratory capacity, which is the TV plus the IRV, which is right here, IRV plus the TV, plus the ERV. So the vital capacity is basically the IC plus the ERV or the IRV plus the TV plus the ERV. And then you see here for total lung capacity. So where do all these values come from? They come from this chart, right? Total lung capacity is all of them. Vital capacity, the first three, so forth and so on. All right. Now that's when you get to here and you learn how to calculate these, this is where you're stopping, by the way. You don't have to go any further down. We're not doing all these other calculations down here.